joining me for this cybersecurity webinar. My name is Chris Cox. I'm one of the cybersecurity instructors here at CDSE. And today we're going to be talking about secure communications in an insecure world. It's really getting to the point where you can hardly turn on the news without hearing about some sort of breach or another high-profile hack, or very likely you're reading that news on a computer or a mobile device of some sort and perhaps wondering if you're secure as you browse the Internet. So today we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can stay safe while doing common tasks online. Or perhaps relevant to you, this might help answer some of the questions that you encounter from your users during training or awareness briefings. Please remember that this presentation is not comprehensive. There's just not enough time to talk about all of the threats and all of the vulnerabilities that you may encounter online. So you're highly encouraged to consider your own online behaviors and the risks related to those. First off, we have to remember that the Internet is big. It's really, really big. In fact, 40% of the world's population is on it. And for every person using it, there's over three devices that use it as well. The Internet of Things, all those different devices and sensors and everything else that's connected to the Internet in one way or another. E-commerce is a huge industry, bringing in $1.5 trillion every year worldwide. Because of the nature of the Internet, it's hard to really pin down exactly how much information is on it. But according to some estimates, Google alone has archived 15 exabytes of information. That's 15 million terabytes. And that number is constantly growing. To put it in context, if all that information were converted to punch cards, it would cover the entire region of New England to almost three miles deep. This information is stored on so many hard drives in Google data centers that one dies every few minutes and it needs to be replaced. And that's all part of the cost of doing business. And the weight of all the electrons alone that are used to store that information is slightly more than the weight of a baseball. So the Internet is big. But of course also that invites new opportunities for cybercrime. In fact, as of according to FBI estimates, there's up to 1.5 million cyber attacks every year. And that's only the ones that are known about and reported to the FBI. And in addition to that, in addition to that, there are 95 million cyber incidents that are also similarly reported. That ends up being a lot of incidents. And once again, it's only those that are actually reported to the FBI. That's not a comprehensive number. That number is likely to be very much higher. That works out to be about 170 every minute. It's a lot of cyber events. In fact, 19% of U.S. organizations have lost more than $50,000 to cybercrime in 2013. And 7% have lost more than $1 million. And that's just talking about businesses. When you include frauds and scams that affect individuals, that number goes up to $781 million in 2013 numbers. And then there's data thefts and breaches. Statistics suggest that about half of you listening today, 47% specifically, have had your data stolen within the last year or so. That number might be a little bit higher for this audience, given the OPM breach. I know I got my letter, and the chances are good that some of you did too, so it affects all of us in one way or another. The Internet touches many aspects of our lives, and it's changed the way we communicate. It's changed the way we do business and we function on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's also opened, a whole, up, opened up a whole new world of crime and risks. So let's talk about a few of them specifically. First, let's take a quick poll. Out of the following functions or programs, which of these do you use? Let's see how we're using the Internet in our daily lives. So we have some ideas as we move forward what we're actually doing. While you're all making your selections, I'll answer them for myself. I'm a big believer in social media. I think it's a great way to keep in touch with friends and family, and it fosters communication between customers and companies and organizations. Of course, I do my banking online, just like online purchasing. Many of us do. And I use a smartphone. I think Skype's a great way to keep in touch with family while away on business. I'm not much of a gamer, but I do keep some backups on the cloud. So let's take a look at what we're actually using it for today. I see that most of us do have some form of social media accounts, but whether it's Facebook, Twitter, use YouTube or blogs or anything else. So we're a pretty connected community. 
Most of us do online banking. In fact, most people do do their banking online. It's much more convenient to be able to deposit checks and make transfers and everything else using your smartphone than having to go into a branch. Most people do make online purchases. It's very popular, very common. Amazon, eBay, some of the largest uh, commercial organizations in the world. And of course, most people, everyone here that answered does use a smartphone. And you'll find your, or cell phone, excuse me, and you'll find you're not alone because most Americans do as well. Many people use Skype. Not many online gamers, but there are, of course, a lot of different ways you can use similar services or play browser games or things like that. And of course, uh, about 40% of us are using some form of cloud storage, whether it's iCloud or Dropbox or something else. So a lot of us are using those services in different ways. And so we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit more specifically about how to remain safe while doing that. First, social media. Social media refers to the websites and the applications that let us share ideas and content with other people. You're probably familiar with many of them. You might recognize some of the, the logos on this screen. Uh, for example, Facebook and Twitter are two of the more popular ones. Uh, blogs are examples of social media, as is YouTube and LinkedIn, services like that. Many websites and organizations try to integrate some form of social component, encouraging visitors to discuss the page or share it via social media or some other way to communicate with other members of that community. Again, it's a good way to keep in touch with friends, families, customers, partners, but it also introduces certain risks that need to be considered and whenever possible remediated in order to lessen the risk. For example, last year, an Australian woman won $825 on a 100 to 1 shot on a horse track and posted this picture on her Facebook account. Of course, the version that she posted didn't have, it, have the number blurred out like it does here or the barcode blurred out, blurred out like it does here. Her caption read, winner, winner, chicken dinner. And she was. She was the winner, but she wasn't the one that got to keep the money. One of her Facebook friends copied the image and was able to retrieve her winnings. This happened in the brief window from the time when she posted this picture that you see and when she went to the teller to actually collect her winnings. Things move fast on the Internet. And once you put something on social media, you really have no way to control where it goes. Of course, you also have to be concerned about malware spreading through links or even infected ads that may slip past. And people using social engineering to get your private information. Hackers can gain information that can be used to compromise your accounts, such as the answers to your password recovery uh, questions. And recent reports show that ISIS is actively using social media to identify and reach out to potential recruits. And of course, you always have to be concerned about what sort of information you're putting out there. What could an adversary do with that information? Would it be useful to a burglar to know when you're on vacation? Would it be helpful for a corporate spy to know when you got that promotion? Would a foreign intelligence agency be interested in knowing your vacation plans overseas? They're on social media too. So be aware of what you post and what you share. Don't provide information that will let others answer your security questions. Some of the common ones include favorite food, favorite color, pet name, your mother's maiden name, where you met your spouse, your anniversary, the high school you attended. Many of those questions can be answered just by looking very carefully at someone's profile or by talking to them via private message. In general, be aware of the things that you post that could allow an adversary to build a profile on you and know where, and so they know where they can start for further efforts. It's good to have the mindset that anything you post, even if it's private, could potentially become inadvertently public at any time. That's because you don't control what your friends share and you don't control the site's security. You can control some of the security settings that they make available to you and should definitely avail yourself of using those. CDSC has created a few job aids that can help you make the account as secure as possible. You'll see that in the link here. But remember that secure as possible isn't always the same thing as secure. You're still trusting them with your security because you don't control that from that, from that level. So just keep in mind that if you don't put it on there, it can't necessarily be used against you. The young man on the left on the screen here is Dmitry Belarusov. He was recently extra, extradited from Spain while on vacation from his home country of Russia and was sentenced to four and a half years for creating malware called Zeus that stole online banking details, credit card data, and other financial information. 
He sold the tool, which he used heavily starting in 2012, to allow cyber criminals to steal over $500 million in that year alone from individuals and financial institutions. Again, it's only the ones that the FBI knows about it. The actual number is likely to be much higher. According to legend, bank robber Willie Sutton was asked why he robbed banks. His answer was, that's where the money is. Criminals go where the money is, and the money's online. There's a lot of ways that hackers will attempt to get that financial data. Malware is one way, but systems, including those used by the banks themselves, can be the target of hacking, social engineering attacks, or phishing attacks. Phishing emails are very common for bank customers. Maybe you've seen some yourself. And they might simply exploit weak passwords and username combinations. And of course, there's the threat of so-called fly-by-night banks, which can set up very quickly, offer great rates, and encourage deposits only to disappear shortly after with the victim's money. So to protect yourself, be aware of phishing attempts. Instead of logging in through a link or a pop-up or an email that you've received, type your bank address directly into the browser using the HTTPS protocol instead of HTTP for added security. Use strong passwords or passphrases and change them regularly. As we've discussed before, make sure your password reset questions can't be easily guessed or determined, and log out when you're done. If you have to leave your computer for any reason when a session is active, make sure to lock your computer. Now, for me personally, I wouldn't do banking in public if I can help it, especially from a public or a library computer. But if you have to, for any reason, watch for anyone looking over your shoulder, or what's called shoulder surfing. And make sure on your personal computer that you install your and update your antivirus software and your firewall. If it's an option, consider using a different computer or device for online banking than the ones used for games and other computing tasks. That way, the one you use for financial data is as secure as possible, even if the other one's compromised. Recently, researchers at UC Riverside were able to receive, achieve extremely high success rates in hacking common device applications in a lab environment. While this assumes that the attacker has physical possession of your device, that's really not all that far-fetched. And it highlights, it highlights the risks associated with having personal information or processing personally sensitive information on your device. Right now, almost all Americans own a cell phone, and a growing number of those are smartphones that can access the Internet. Currently, 63% of Americans use their phones to access the Internet, and 21% use that device exclusively for their connectivity. In fact, a few of you may be using your device to access this webinar uh, either now or previous times. Very ubiquitous, very useful form of communication. So a lot of people are using mobile devices. That much we knew. And along with that rise in use comes a rise in exploitation. It's only natural and predictable. As of last year, there were 16 million identified malware infections targeting mobile devices specifically. And one in four people have had their devices either lost or stolen, along with whatever information they might have on it. And as we saw in the example here, if an attacker can actually get access to your device, their odds of being able to breach your security goes up significantly. So many of the ways that you might protect your mobile device are going to be similar to the ways you protect your computer. A lot of the concepts are the same. Try to use secure protocols to browse the Internet, again, HTTPS, especially when shopping online or doing online banking. And use a strong password for your device. If you enable the Find My Phone feature, it will help you find your phone in the event that you lose it or misplace it. At the same time, that also means your device is tracking your location when it's with you, which is a trade-off that you need to make. Be careful when connecting to untrusted Wi-Fi networks, such as those that might be found in airports or coffee shops or hotels. They could possibly be owned by someone that's trying to intercept your traffic. Take time to research common scams and signs of phishing, so you'll recognize them when they come up, and they will come up. Check your app and device privacy settings, and only install apps from trusted sources. Delete apps you don't use, and keep the ones that you do use, as well as your device itself, updated. And finally, consider mobile security software if a version is available for your device. Now I use Skype as an example here, but the basic idea is the same for other video communications programs. In fact, the idea is pretty much the same for other, any device that communicates or any software that communicates via the Internet. 
But Skype is one example of software that by its nature directly interfaces with the Internet itself. So the software is going to be continuously probed for vulnerabilities that could be exploited. That's why it's important to keep the software patched and updated in order to close those vulnerabilities before they're discovered on your system. There have been several events in the news where Skype accounts have been compromised, prompting users to change their passwords, something we probably should be doing regularly anyways. Online games are one thing that don't get much attention when we're talking about security. But just like any other online service, there are certain vulnerabilities and risks that have to be considered when using it, maybe more in some cases. Some online games are developed by small individuals or small groups, and security might not necessarily be their area of expertise or even their focus. In some ways, the social element of online gaming can be one of the greatest risks. You don't necessarily know who you're playing with or where they're from, so they may or may not be people that can be trusted. So you still have to be cautious of social engineering and also of people getting enough information about you to steal your identity or compromise your account or leverage further attacks. Like any other form of communication, be careful in opening links that may be sent as well if the software allows it. The other type of risk associated with online gaming are more technical and include compromises that might occur on the server side, potentially exploiting vulnerabilities in your browser or your system itself. So take time to research the game from a security perspective and use their official launcher downloaded from a trusted site, generally from their website. As always, install and update anti-malware and firewall software and use strong passwords on your account. Keep your software, operating system, and browser updated and be especially careful about links that might be shared via the chat or other sharing options. Remember OPSEC when you're playing with strangers from all over the world. Most of the time, you really have no idea who you're playing with or where they're from or who they may be affiliated with. And I'd also like to mention briefly administrative mode. Some software prompts you to switch to administrative mode in the operating system in order to install it. Many times, that's legitimately required by the program. However, just bear in mind that you're giving that installer elevated rights on the system. If you can't trust the source of that software, it's going to be a huge security risk. A question did just come through regarding the last slide. I want to address it while it's uh, re recent. Does FaceTime have the same risks as Skype? And absolutely, the same concept applies to any video sharing in that it's necessary to keep it updated as much as possible in order to close the security risks that come up. There have been fewer public or at least high-profile security um, breaches that have to do with FaceTime, but it's still the same type of software that does communicate openly with the Internet. So it's very being public-facing from a technical sense means you definitely need to keep it updated, patched, and of course keep it uh, uninstalled if you're not using it. The word cloud has become one of the general catch-all phrases for backing something up across the network. And that is one aspect of it, but there's much more to cloud storage than that. Cloud storage refers to a model where data is kept at a remote location and is made available via a network, normally the Internet. Backups can be automatic where files are synced in the background to a remote location, or it can be a manual process where you upload your files from your system. The benefit of cloud computing is it can be easier to centralize security, and it certainly does help provide backups in the event that something happens to a system or local data. It also allows for collaboration, which is especially valuable for a distributed organization. But it also offers another avenue for attackers to steal data. You may remember this. It was big news a little while ago. In 2014, many celebrities had their private and personal pictures stolen off of iCloud. It came from a vulnerability that was discussed in a Russian security forum, forum in which it was noted that, among other things, Apple wasn't limiting login attempts. The same organization, the same researchers, released a proof-of-concept script to demonstrate the concept. Not surprisingly, that script was modified by malicious attackers and used to compromise the accounts. The images were originally traded or sold before being shared freely, freely via social networking and other websites. In this case, the specific vulnerability has been closed, but the nature of cloud computing means that the providers are constantly being probed for the next big vulnerability. So there's a few things that you can do to protect yourself when using cloud computing. 
Use two-factor authentication whenever possible. That's where you need more than one authentication method to log in. For example, your normal password plus a PIN number that might be sent to your cell phone. That way, even if your password is compromised, the attacker can't log in without that second piece of information. But even still, your password or your passphrase should be secure and complex, and also unique from other sites. Make sure you're using a secure host for your data, that they have effective physical and personnel security controls, and that their contract, if you have one, covers the security obligations and uptime requirements. They should also maintain access logs to assist in incident response and comply with legal and regulatory requirements. This information isn't always possible to get, especially for an individual personal account. But the organizational contract should specifically address those issues. Whenever possible, encrypt your data. Many of these systems and software solutions do that automatically when it's on the server. But if it doesn't, you might need to find other ways to encrypt your data to keep it secure. And know when you're using cloud backups. It's possible that your system might be configured to automatically send data to another location without your knowledge, especially if you're running iCloud or Dropbox or a similar program. So be aware if your system is using that so you know where your data is going. So just a few more things to remember. Take the time to research common scams and threats. The Internet Crime Complaint Center, hosted by the FBI, has current information on scams and fraud alerts. And the U.S. Computer Emergency Response Team, or U.S. CERT, regularly publishes vulnerability alerts and other information. And of course, stay up to date on cybersecurity concepts and trends at the CDSC website. All those links are provided here on your screen. Make sure to keep your software patched and your systems updated and up to date and consider encrypting your data using a VPN to protect your traffic when it's traversing the network or the Internet itself. And finally, make sure to use strong, unique passwords for each account. It can be tempting to reuse your strong passwords, but that means that multiple accounts might be compromised if that reused password is somehow obtained. So now I'd like to open it up for any questions about what we've discussed here. I'll pause for a moment if you want to bring up any questions that I can answer or that we can perhaps discuss as a group. Okay, we do have one that had come in, is I know how to report incidents at work, but who do I report it to if something happens at home? And that's a really good point. Of course, we all should know who to report incidents to at work. We should have an incident response plan. Very important to have that, where each user can understand not only what to look for, what to identify that might be a sign of a compromise or a hack or a malware, uh, infection, but also who to report it to. Those precious first couple moments can make the difference between a small infection and a major incident. Now, of course, at home, we don't necessarily have the same resources, the same first responders or the same IT staff that's going to come in and actually help us with those, um, with those situations. So, of course, there are people who report it to. If a crime has been committed, such as fraud or something like that, or hacking, uh, the police are, is one of the first points of contact. But also there's the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center. Not only do they compile these statistics and this data, but they also can assist in the response as well. And that link was provided in the previous slide. What does VPN do for a user using a public network? That's an excellent question. A VPN is a virtual private network, and essentially it tunnels in for your information through the network. It provides an encrypted link between yourself and the VPN provider, which all your information goes through before passing out the other end to your final destination, your final location. Some of the VPNs are geared towards privacy, where they don't keep logs or anything else, but generally speaking, they all provide that additional layer of security. So for example, it's not uncommon to be sitting at a fire at a um, hotel or at a coffee shop and you see free Wi-Fi pop up. In many cases, that is legitimately owned by the organization. But in some cases, that particular access point can be compromised by an attacker, or it can be someone sitting across the street with their own laptop and an antenna that's pretending to be a wireless access, access point. So through connect, by connecting to them to go to your uh, destination, they can actually sniff, they can actually detect and view all of your, tra your traffic. So using a VPN encrypts it in transit so they won't be able to actually view what it is. What are the limits of 
perimeter-oriented security posture? This is a really good question. If I understand it correctly, the question is, what are the limits of having an organization that, or having a security posture that protects the boundaries, but doesn't have anything to protect the inside? And the limits are severe. I think it was Bruce Schneer that called that uh, M&M security, or candy-coated security, where you have a hard, crunchy shell, but once you get past that, you're soft and defenseless. So it's, a, it's essential to have security both on the outside to keep the bad guys out, but also on the inside. That means that you have your firewalls, you have your intrusion detection and prevention mechanisms that actually keep the traffic, the malicious traffic on the outside as much as possible. But also you need to have security mechanisms on the inside to protect against the attackers that might gain entry through the boundary or malicious insiders as well. A lot of different ways to do that. Partially it's security controls, but there's also uh, intrusion prevention detection on the internal network, uh, firewalls, logs is another big piece of it, log review and things like that. So it's, a, it's important that the organization not only look at their security from a boundary perspective, but also internally as well. So how should an organization think about cyber defense? An organization, any organization should consider that to be a mission enabler. Essentially, there's always a balance, there's always a trade-off between security and usability. The reality is, is that the only secure system is encased in concrete and at the bottom of a river. At that point, it's very, very secure, but it's not very usable. And if some commanders or bosses or C-level executives or things like that, coming from that perspective, have a perfectly usable system, might not necessarily be secure because some of the security requirements may limit some of the usability. So it's important that the organization see cybersecurity as a preventative me measure that's going to allow them to continue to do their functions. I look back at the previous statistics where we say that 19% or 21% of U.S. organizations have lost more than $50,000 in a breach, in a single breach, it's not cumulative, and more than 7% have lost more than a million dollars. When an organization has an incident that actually does occur, then at that point, when it's too late, they may understand just how many man hours and just how much, uh, how much money they end up spending on this. Essentially, you can look at any high-profile breach in the news, look at that newspaper and imagine what it would be if your organization was in that headline. So essentially, it keeps them in operation, and it, in the long run, it saves money. Um, how do hotspots, do hotspots operate like a VPN or is this an open network? I assume you're talking about Wi-Fi hotspots and they do not. A Wi-Fi hotspot hot spot does give you access to the network. Uh, however, you're also connecting through that particular access point. So if that access point is compromised, then whoever compromised it can also view your traffic. In some cases, there are security measures that are put on that hotspot that may help prevent that. But generally speaking, whenever possible, you want to control your own security. As much as possible, you want to be the one that's in charge of your security requirements. So by encrypting from your computer to your destination or to the VPN host, or in the case of HTTPS, to the final destination, should be using both, then um, you can definitely remain more secure in that way. And I see one more question that had come through. My daughter has an iPhone. She hasn't linked to her home computer. A message pops up on her home computer telling us that her cloud storage is full. Is there a way for an attacker to get into my home computer through her iPhone? Um, essentially, yes, there are, there are several ways depending on the configuration of the iPhone. It could be functioning as a hotspot, allow access to the network. Um, without, it's very case dependent, but basic concepts is you do want to make sure that security measures are enacted on the iPhone, make sure that any unauthorized services are disabled or any apps are removed when they, if they aren't being used. And of course, as always, make sure that it's updated using the latest software, the latest security software if possible, and that the apps and services are also updated as well. That way you can lower the risk. The core concept is we can never get rid of the risk completely as long as we want to actually communicate with the outside world, but the best we can do is lower it to an acceptable level. And I think we do have one time for one more quick question. Is all of my email is already encrypted at work? How can I encrypt my email and my computer at home? And that's a really good question. One that I want to harp on is that at work we have it kind of easy. It's generally done by another organization. We log in and everything's encrypted, fairly transparent to us. It's not necessarily the case at home. There is encryption built into the operating system in most cases. For example, a BitLocker in most current versions of Windows. 
And there's other open source tools that can do that in the event that it doesn't exist. Uh, as we mentioned, you can encrypt your internet traffic through a VPN, especially important at an airport or public or hotel, places like that. Using Outlook, you can encrypt your email using the encryption and the security settings. And the web-based uh, web -based email providers like Gmail or Hotmail, they do encrypt it, your information on the server. Of course, do make sure that using HTTPS to protect your email when it passes from your computer when you type it to the server itself. And one more question just came through that we'll address before moving on. If a foreign national brings in a cell phone, is there a potential for that phone, that phone to jump onto a firewalled company network? Um, generally speaking, yes, there is potential. However, if the system is properly secured to disallow those untrusted connect, uh, connections, then um, you can lower that risk once again. Generally speaking, you always want to be able to control or know what's on your network. But if the network is misconfigured or in the hopefully unlikely event that you have a malicious or careless insider that might uh, allow things that shouldn't be allowed, then that is certainly a risk. So anything that's connecting to your network, you want to strictly control it. In the event you do allow things to connect to a guest network, it needs to be strictly isolated from the production network. And there's technical ways to do that, but the IT staff should be aware of that requirement as well. So thank you very much for those great questions. If you do end up having any more, feel free to reach out to this address here that I'm providing. Reach us the cybersecurity team at cybersecurity.training at dss.mil. I really want to thank you for taking the time to join me today, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, please take a moment to give us your feedback after we end here. There's a few poll questions that did just come up on your screen, which will allow us to better meet your needs in the future. Until next time, this is Chris Cox reminding you to stay safe online, and thank you for your time.